How do we, how do we get this technology out on a large enough scale quickly enough to keep us from going off a cliff? I, I think what we need to do is have, as Bob said, 10 to 12 major projects. We need to go to work on them now and, and, and deploy the technology. The capture part of it is fairly well known and understood. The sequestration is incredibly complex. A lot of people talk about enhanced oil recovery. Well, if you can do that, you can do this. Not true. Mm -hmm. There, you're just you're putting a molecule of CO2 in and pushing out a molecule of oil or gas. And even there, you have some leakage of CO2. This is fundamentally different because you're pushing in molecules of CO2 and then brime is moving out and we don't quite know what that means. So the impediments to getting it done is cost and, and viability, because we don't know that yet. These major projects would allow it. The other is public acceptance, because will the public accept storing that much CO2 underground, and it's massive? And the third thing is what are the regulations going to be with respect to regulating the storage? I, I'm in the gas business, used to run gas storage operations. Those are understood, we're able to do it, but it took many years to develop the regulations, and we need to develop the regulations in terms of how to operate a sequestered area. Bob? I, I wanted to uh, uh, point out that it, it, it's important to think about China not in terms of our developing the technology and then handing it over to the Chinese, but rather to find ways to co-evolve the technology together. And in many ways, China is in a much better position to, uh, to do early action on carbon capture and storage than we are. And, and, the, and the main reason for that is that the, we have very little in the way of uh, gasification energy technology in this country. There are a couple of plants, and, and, and Jim's company is going to build one of the next uh, plants, but China has a large number of gasification facilities, none of them yet in the power sector or the energy sector. They're all in the chemical process industry. And they're making hydrogen to make, to make ammonia fertilizer. They're, they're making methanol as a chemical. And they're starting to make synfuels. They're making uh, uh, both, uh, they have plans to make uh, gasoline from methanol a plant that's going to come online at the end of this year is the first plant in the world that's going to make uh, uh, gasoline from methanol derived from coal. It's a small 3,000 uh, uh, barrel per day facility, but that's the first synfuel plant that's been built in the world uh, for uh, about 25 years. And they have several other uh, synfuel plants that make methanol to make dimethyl ether as a clean cooking fuel. And, and all of these plants generate streams of pure CO2 that are released to the atmosphere. And so the cost of capturing that CO2 is incredibly low, because all you have to do is pay for the cost of compressing it. And so the United States and China ought to be explore ways to work together to get some of these 10 to 12 initial projects off the ground, not in, just in this country and not just in Europe, but also in, in, in China, and engage the, the Chinese intellectually and technologically in these efforts as uh, 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 and, and, and try to move this thing forward together. I mean, this. some of you would have heard Daniel Nocera talk the first evening, okay? He talked, he addressed the terawatt challenge, and there are these brilliant Nobel class scientists all over the country, all over the world now, wrestling with these dilemmas. Uh, how are you gonna run the world at mid-century with nine billion people? And, and hopefully have a third the carbon emissions we have today or 20% of what we have today. And the truth is no one knows. But what everybody is clear about is that the scale of this challenge is so enormous. One of the people that wrestled with the terawatt challenge, this guy Rick Smalley, uh, won a Nobel Prize in chemistry for his work on nanotechnology. He said, you know, you, you need 10 miracles, Smalley concluded. He, he said, I, I think we'll find some of them out there. Miracles in thin film PV and superconductivity and bioengineering and perhaps second generation biofuels, all these different areas. But he said, we're not gonna find them unless we go looking for them. And spending $200 million on, which is just a pittance. It's like spending a dollar 
You know, it's, it's spending nothing, basically. I mean, we've been hearing about carbon sequestration for a decade now and have really made very little progress here in the U.S. on it. It just blows my mind because it is one of the areas where you can get some agreement between Republicans and Democrats and even among environmentalists and people on, in the coal industry that this is a key technology. It's important to find out if we can do this or not and what it costs. Coal power doing this, fully clean coal power doing this might be eight or nine cents wholesale. Might even be higher than that. I suspect it could be higher than that given the recent run up and costs of building anything now. Some environmentalists would argue, now wait a minute, they'd say to Bob, they'd say, now wait, Bob, you're talking a billion tons, a billion tons is dealing with 20 million barrels a day of supercritical CO2. So we would now be dealing with, uh, as 20 million barrels a day, we'd be dealing as, with as much supercritical CO2 as we're now dealing with petroleum. So just the plumbing project which would take 10 or 15 or 20 years, 30 years uh, to implement. Just the pipelines and the plumbing itself is mind boggling. And so some environmentalists that I know would say, man, this is like a fantasy. This is a mirage. Because once we've done this, we're still faced with the question of, okay, now what? Coal is not sustainable in the long term in terms of its supply. There's some interesting new research by a guy named Dave Rutledge at Caltech, and he argues that coal is much more constrained globally than we've been led to believe. That's a minority viewpoint, but it's an intriguing lecture that you can see online if you're interested in coal supplies. So some people would say, now what? We're still going to have to go to wind or solar or nuclear, some combination of efficiency in those things in the long run. Maybe we ought to forget about carbon sequestration and, and put our money, if we're going to do a big project, if we're going to do an Apollo project, a Manhattan plan, uh, let's do it with wind and solar and efficiency and not worry about this. That doesn't address Jim's problem of, he's got, how many customers you got? Four million. Four million. Many of them in the southeast, where people in the summer are using, what, 3,000 kilowatt hours a month? Uh, to air condition their poorly designed homes in a really punitive climate. In the meantime, the U.S. is adding 30 million people every decade. We're going to be at 400 million by 2030. We've got these 50 and 60 year old coal plants out there. Um, half of the natural gas we're using in this country is coming from wells that are less than three years old and will need to be replaced with new drilling in the next three years. So the terawatt challenge after wrestling with it for about 10 years myself, I think it's the fastest way to insanity uh, that you can imagine. Because God, we want a solution to the climate problem. We so want it, we're craving it, we're dying for it. But they, all of them, seem a little fantastic to me 